Hey everyone. So everybody that wanders in late is gonna miss all the good jokes. So just, that's too bad for them. Because I wanna start that way because the light of, in light of the discussion that we've had today, I didn't realize halfway through the day I was gonna get nominated for an important office. And so I would like to now take a moment to proudly accept, proudly, not humbly, proudly accept the nomination made for me to be the first Christian prince of Christian nationalism. I would actually prefer to be humble and decline, but the call to power is in fact irresistible. Gollum, Gollum. And you know, I, to be honest with you, this wasn't unexpected. Because um, I've had a very careful reading of the Bible, and it's prophesied in the Bible, I think in the book of James, obviously, that the Christian prince will be coming to you and you'll recognize him and know him by his Adidas Sambas. I'm just joking, we all know the Christian prince will have obscenely expensive shoes. That's a Christian joke. <laughs> so, my talk yesterday was about Mao, as you know if you were here, and my talk tonight is actually, it's got a title I want to draw your attention to so we know why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. The title of this talk is, Reaction is the Real Action. And so, what I brought up at the beginning yesterday, and we're going to talk about political warfare again today uh, is that the left works operationally. The, you have to think operationally because they think operationally. They aren't acting random. They aren't acting crazy in the kind of clinical sense that they have, you know, random behavior that's unpredictable. It might be unpredictable to you, but that's because you don't know that they're operating according to a program or an operating system. And so reaction is the real action is actually a principle out of one of their activist guidebooks. In fact, more than one of their activist guidebooks. They intentionally act in bizarre and provocative and unconscionable ways to provoke a reaction because they believe that your reaction is their real action. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, just to remind you first about last night we talked about Mao, who was one of the most successful left-wing and this was the fancy words, dialectical political warfare tacticians in history. Uh, very, very successful. You can tell because he maybe killed 100 million people with it. That's what success with dialectical political warfare usually amounts to, is a lot of dead people. We also concluded that the West and America specifically are being put through a woke cultural revolution um, and that we have to do something about that. So why on earth would they be putting the West through a cultural revolution? Well, we talked about that yesterday too. The obvious goal is power. They want to take power, which they can then wield. But I want to remind you of what the cultural Marxist Antonio Gramsci said. Uh, and he said, socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. And so if we wonder why, it's because socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. So the attack on Christianity is what I want to draw your attention to. And I also want to draw your attention to the idea that he didn't say socialism needs to destroy or even replace Christianity. He said it has to overwhelm Christianity. And so what we're actually going to see is, I think through my lecture tonight, is that the goal is going to be to transform Christianity into a uh, false religion, a false version of itself. Um, that's what this cultural revolution is about, and this reaction, rea uh, this action and reaction cycle that they're, they're inducing is going to have specific purposes for overwhelming Christianity and making it so Christianity is not a cultural force that can stand in their way. And that's bad, because we concluded that we have to stop this cultural revolution if we care about freedom and liberty, uh, if we care about individual liberties, preserving that for future generations. And we left off with some questions which are, can a cultural revolution that has started already be stopped? And if so, how do we do it? Well, we've heard repeatedly, we're in the right setting for it in a church, we've heard repeatedly, obviously, that Christianity can play a major role in that. I think many people understand that. I know Shee Van Fleet, who spoke yesterday, has said many times uh, that Christianity, in fact, is an absolutely key ingredient in stopping that, and she, of course, survived the Cultural Revolution in China. She thinks it's a key ingredient uh, in stopping the American Cultural Revolution. 
But if we're going to stop it, we have to understand dialectical political warfare because that's what it is. Mao is just an example. There are other countries where this has happened, and ours may become one of them. Unless we understand how it works, then maybe we can stop it. And so when we start to understand how dialectical political warfare works, we understand that there are right and wrong ways to engage it. The title of the talk, Reaction is the Real Action, should tell you that if you engage it wrongly, you help them. You don't stop them, you help them. And reaction is, in fact, a wrong way to engage a dialectical political warfare uh, operation. So just to remind you, political warfare, this is going to be very important, means using political means to get your opponent to do what you want with hostile intent. So you're going to use propaganda, you're going to use political manipulation, you're going to do all kinds of things of that sort to get your opponent to do something that is strategically advantageous to you and strategically disadvantageous to them. And the goal is to get your opponent to react and to act in the way that you want them to so you can manipulate the situation. So dialectical political warfare always has a hostile intent to induce reactions. They want their opponent to react in predictable and useful ways. That's the heart and soul of political warfare. And dialectical political warfare being dialectical, remember the dialectic proceeds through conflict. That's what we discussed. And it was my summary definition, which I borrowed from a woman who studied USSR Soviet communism named Julie Bailing. Uh, she actually has a book uh, called Beneath Sheep's Clothing, and she says, I read it, and I said, why couldn't I have thought of that sentence? Communism always marries a truth to a lie. So dialectics is marrying a truth and a lie. And uh, what dialectical political warfare does is it provokes conflict in order to create apparent opposites that generate the energy for political warfare action. So the point of today in this conference overall has been to address the rise of a reaction called Christian nationalism that is taking place. It might be still on the ascendant or it might be a little bit past its prime. I'm not quite sure where it stands. We'll see. I think that has a lot to do with people like us. But it has enjoyed several months or a year or so uh, of growth and it is a blatant reaction. In fact, I think there has maybe never been a more obvious trap uh, where I've spent many a frustrated moment in the last year. Mike will know on the phone saying, is there a single hole in the ground that the left can dig that the right doesn't want to jump face first into? Oh, look, a hole. Let's go. We already know, for example, that Christian nationalism has been a bad word in the media for many years. We already know, for example, that Christian nationalism has been closely associated with white nationalism, at least cognitively, in the low information sector that the Democratic and the uh, left-wing activists in the media appeal to. As a matter of fact, that is so strong that when Mike first reached out to me, and some of you have heard the story of how Mike and I met, he reached out to my friend first, his name's Peter, and he called Peter, and Peter calls me and was like, this guy wants us to come to this Christian conference, it's the G3 conference that year, wants it in January, he wants us to come, it's like in two weeks, we have to go, we have to go, you have to go. And I said, who is this guy? He says, Mike O'Fallon, Mike O'Fallon, big guy, big Christian, you got to talk to him. And so I look it up, I type it into the Google, first thing that pops up is a right wing watch article, hit piece that was written about Michael O'Fallon that alleged that he was a Christian nationalist, which my brain as a slowly leaving leftist thought person immediately translated into white nationalist. I called Peter Beck and said, no, we can't work with him, he's a Nazi. That is going to happen to millions of people when they hear the words Christian nationalism. That, it doesn't matter how nuanced you are in your church, it doesn't matter how nuanced you are at a G3 or whatever other, or any, I'm just using them because of the, the past, they're not doing anything wrong necessarily. Conference, if you speak at a Christian conference and you're all nuanced and you write a whole freaking 475 page book like Stephen Wolf did, doesn't matter, the overwhelming base that votes Democrat in this country will turn Christian nationalist into white nationalist as fast as they can read the word nationalist. And you have to understand this. And you have to understand that the federal government, which is weaponizing against conservatives that are against their agenda, understands this perfectly. There has never been a more obvious trap. There has been a dialectical narrative arc, which we'll talk lots about in, this, in the next lecture as well, being laid for years now, waiting for people to decide to boldly proclaim, I am that. And then they spring the trap. 
So I think that's primarily what it is. I don't have a ton of direct commentary at this point on Christian nationalism specifically. I don't want to actually outline detailed arguments against it. We heard many of those today. They came from pastors. They came from theologians. They're better than I can do. I have just a few remarks. We will get into some of the weeds about Christian nationalism specifically later, but I just want to give a few quick remarks. The first is that actually a nickname that I came up with for Christian nationalism is basically, you know how they got like the, the thing and then there's like the Christian knockoff. You got like rock and roll, then you got Christian rock. And then like Hank Hill has to do a thing on the cartoon and he says, why are you doing Christian rock? It's not, you're not making Christianity, Christianity any better. You're only making rock and roll worse. Well, we've got a Christian knockoff here because Christian nationalism is basically Christian build back better. Think about it. What are they going to do? We're going to have a new founding, renew America. We're going to have build back better, but Christian style. Build back Babylon maybe is a better way. Somebody put on Twitter when I said the joke on Twitter about it. Um, I will point out, as some other people mentioned throughout the day, that it lacks a clear and consistent definition, which should be alarming to you. The first thing that people ask when they hear, are you Christian nationals? What do you think of Christian nationals? Well, the first thing they say is, well, well, what do you mean? Nobody's quite sure what it means. Is it something as diffuse as when somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene stands up and says, well, I'm a Christian who believes in my country, so yeah, I'm a Christian nationalist? Or is it something as specific as this 475-page book by, by Stephen Wolfe that goes into all these details about a Christian prince bestriding the land and all of this or whatever else it's got in there? A magistrate, 475 pages of... Of, of kind of political philosophy on what it really entails, some of which sounds pretty scary, as we heard throughout the day. When you have a situation where you have a lack of a clear definition and people willing to kind of build a coalition around a vague definition that's sometimes really scary and sometimes really benign, that suggests that what's happening is being framed dialectically. In other words, it might be a dialectical political warfare object as opposed to a good faith movement that's trying to lay out what it's about clearly. That, remain, that means that we're marrying a truth, which is the idea of maybe a cultural renewal, a call to repentance or even Christian belief, a call back to patriotism, caring about what this country is about, caring about the role that Jewish and Christian values have, have played in forming our nation. That's a truth. And it marries it to a lie, which is a maybe power-grabbing agenda. That allows a very subtle kind of lying that's really only apparent in the dialectical space, where the, the lie feels more true than true. Um, I think you might refer to it as bearing false witness, and if I, and I might make another comment about this group of people that I've now had the distinct displeasure of working up against on social media, where they seem to be the, it's really almost the only place they have any existence. Um, Bearing false witness seems to be the first commandment of the so-called so Christian nationalism movement. I've never, I've dealt with woke people, I've dealt with communists, I've never dealt with people who lie more than these people about other people. Never dealt with people who lie about other people more than these people, which is not becoming of a Christian. It looks to me, looking at it as kind of stepping away and dispassionately as possible, that there's a predetermined goal in search of an argument. They want power, they want to try to fix America or whatever it is they think that they want, and it needs a justification, so they're searching for a justification, writing 475-page books to find it. That, yet again, feels dialectical. It's backwards. It's putting the cart before the horse, as once confused my daughter. I brought, brought that out, and I said, honey, I think you're putting the cart before the horse. She said, I don't get why we're talking about horses all of a sudden, but I'm out. Every time, as one last kind of comment in general about it, every time I say anything about Christian nationalism within minutes, I get accused of attacking Christians. That's contrived. That was the other word I gave for a dialectical, right? It's contrived. It's synthetic is the technical word contrived. You know, you think, but James, you are attacking people who profess to be Christian, and I'm not going to call into question whether or not they're real Christian. Actually, I do on Twitter all the time. I call them fake Christians like every day, so maybe I guess I can't lie about that. Unlike them, I don't bear that much false witness. <laughs> like fake Christian, okay. Um, but that's contrived. You will be familiar with this experience if we take it out of the normal context that you're, you, know, you identify with. If you identify as, a, as Christian, you're going to feel like, well, maybe you are attacking Christians because these people are Christians and you're attacking them. 
That's the same as if you say, maybe we shouldn't transition children, or maybe we shouldn't put drag queens in front of kids doing sexual performances, and the media says you are an anti-LGBT bigot that attacked gay people. They are taking a very small group of ideological people who are attached to a label, in this case, Christian, and saying to question them is to question all of them, is to question every Christian, not their specific politics. It's to say with the LGBT situation, to question transition or drag queens or something egregious at Pride or whatever other provocation they've thrown in front of us, is to attack gay people. That's obviously bogus, but a better word would be contrived or dialectical. This is a dialectical move. The Christian nationalist thing, whether it's got honest players in it or not, whether it's mostly honest players, whether it's all honest players, is still part of a dialectical system. And you know that's probably true because these same people who bear false witness repeatedly every time I mention that it's a dialectical system make memes making fun of the word dialectical because they don't want people to think that maybe it's dialectical. Oh, James is talking about the dialectic again. Ha, 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 dialectic, it's stupid. They don't want you to think that maybe it's dialectical. So my objective tonight is not going to be to talk too much about Christian nationalism specifically. It's going to be to frame this Christian nationalism reaction in terms of dialectical political warfare, which is what it is writ large. Christian nationalism is unambiguously a reaction movement or a reactionary movement. It is seeing the cultural provocations, they call it degradation or whatever, that we see all around us, and reacting to that. They're reacting to the provocations visited upon us by the woke communists. This means that they are placing themselves, whether honest brokers or dishonest brokers, within the dynamic of the dialectical political warfare machine, whether or not they mean to. And that dynamic they place themselves within is called the action-reaction dynamic, which is the rough idea behind the title of the talk. Reaction is the real action. So whether or not we face infiltration, which is to say that there are, say, federal agents or leftists posing as Christians, whipping up the Christian nationalist movement to make them do something stupid, a false flag as it were, whether or not that is the case, what we have is them participating in a contrived pattern of behavior and dynamic that has been laid out and will be weaponized, I will utterly convince you of that, that this dynamic will be used to be weaponized against Christians. And just like I get accused of attacking Christians for saying something about Christian nationalist beliefs specifically, you can bet that when this gets weaponized, it will not only get weaponized against the hardcore Christian nationalist activists, whatever their motivations, it will get actualized against Christians writ large. Conservative Christians, at least, uh, in the general, will be brought under scrutiny. Just like when any man does anything bad, now it's toxic masculinity and all men are complicit by something like patriarchy or something. Same thing. So what is this action-reaction dynamic? I want to remind you that dialectical political warfare operates along a dynamic spiral. I have a cool graphic for that I showed you last night. We can bring it back up. If it pops up, we'll see it. The goal is to get people to argue back and forth, we'll put it, in a horizontal direction so that you generate the energy to move vertically. So there's the spiral. This is how they believe history works. This is how they believe political movement takes place. If you want to go up on a spiral, you don't go up you go sideways so that you go around it, step by step. They want to move up, which means they have a political target in what we're calling the vertical direction. And the way they generate the energy to move there is they get a back and forth argument going. So maybe you get Christian nationalists to fight with the woke back and forth, back and forth. And what you hear them say in very kind of falsely dichotomous terms are, well, basically, and this is all over the internet if you follow any of these, these, these punks, frankly, online, is that you're either Christian nationalist or you're homosexual. You're either Christian nationalist or you're pro-transition of children. You only have two choices, and they're these two obvious bad choices that cause people to fight across what appears to be a gulf of opposites, and that generates a ton of energy. 
The left, every single time they say that, can say, look how bad homophobia is in our country for real. They actually are transphobic. People that have much more uh, calm voices are actually feeding that movement and supporting it. And they can discredit the whole thing and move upward, which is the goal. Discredit those people so that conservative Christians' voices are no longer relevant. That's one turn up the spiral. Conservative Christians aren't relevant anymore. One more turn up the spiral will be something like there are only churches that are under our direction like they have in China with a three-self church today. So they use horizontal argument back and forth to generate the energy to move vertically. So their goal is to provoke horizontal fighting back and forth. That's action and reaction. You do an action to provoke a reaction, and the reaction that you provoke is planned to make your enemy look bad or become the justification for a political change or agenda you want to implement. In other words, they're tricking you. Every single time you fall for one of their things and react, they tricked you. Now, this, di this diagram, was, it's not a corkscrew. Notice it's a spiral to a point. I want to just remind you real quick that the point of the dialectic is to complete history, which seems like a very um, bold agenda, and to take it to its intended end point, and that's to happen through generating this conflict to er erase the distinctions between opposites. So as you move up this spiral, the difference between good and bad, if you think of that as the far sides, gets closer and closer together. And at the final point, there is no good or bad. Good and bad are the same thing. Or man and woman are the same thing. Right and wrong are the same thing. True and false are the same thing. That's the objective, to spiral through history to the end of history, to the omega point or the eschaton. And vertical movement along the direction of the spiral is in fact how that's to be achieved. Which means they have political objectives in the up direction and get you to fight in the sideways direction. And when you fight in the sideways direction, not only are you not stopping them, you're helping them get the energy to go. Remember when John Benzinger talked earlier and he said that we fight with each other, we fight amongst ourselves, and meanwhile they just march forward. Well, that's because we're fighting sideways and they're moving up. You're never going to stop them that way. If you want to stop them from going up, you better figure out where they're going and get on top of them. It's not actually that complicated. If you don't know that their goal is to move a different direction, you'll never figure it out. And they'll move forward every single time and you'll sit there holding your thumbs wondering how it happened. What that vertical movement is is what they call transforming history. That's the sublation in, in the Marxist language. It's Aufheben in German. If you've heard my other talks, you'll know what that means. But it means to transform history toward its intended end point through the dialectical conflict. It's all about generating that conflict. Just keep that in mind because that's what generates the energy to move up the spiral. So you have to have conflict between apparent opposites to move history. How can you do that? Well, if you don't have conflict naturally, you can provoke conflict because your real action is your target's reaction. So I want to read to you from a very important book that I really encourage you to take the time to read. It's Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky, published in 1971. This was the kind of original 1970s manual for communist street activists and tacticians. Uh, for those of you who wonder, the, you know, you Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA, it's now I think 11 years old, if I remember what he said correctly. And for the first eight or nine years, and maybe they still do, I don't know, he required everybody who became an employee to read Rules for Radicals so they could understand their enemy. That's why Turning Point's been so effective. He understands more of how the enemy thinks than normal people do. And so I'll read to you from, from Saul Alinsky. He says, imagination is not only the fuel for the force that keeps organizers organizing, the organizers like Barack Obama, it is also the basis for effective tactics and action. The organizer knows that the real action is in the reaction of the opposition. To realistically appraise and anticipate the probable reactions of the enemy, he must be able to identify with them, too, in his imagination, and foresee their reactions to his actions, which he summarized in two bullet points. The real action is in the enemy's reaction, and the enemy, properly goaded and guided in his reaction, will be your major strength. If you can make somebody do something stupid, you can capitalize on the stupid thing they did. This is 
updated in a new manual that you can all go find online for free. Actually, you can read Rules for Radicals online for free too. Just type it into Google, it'll pop up, it's all. The communists are good to their word about one thing. Most of their literature is online for free. They do believe in distributing it like religious people would, so they spread it far and wide with no cost to the person getting it. How about that? It's a very religious movement. But they have an updated version called Beautiful Trouble. How many times have you heard Democratic politicians come out and say, we've got to make good trouble? They just said it about the affirmative action decision. We've got to make good trouble. AOC says good trouble all the time. Well, Beautiful Trouble is the name of their activist manual and the updated version has lots of tactics, lots of principles, lots of stories, lots of ideas. You can actually read their playbook. It's published for free, it's easily accessible. I spend time on the website frequently myself. It's very helpful. And to quote from them, there's an entire principles entry on the page titled, Your Real Action is Your Opponent's Reaction. And they say, when challenging a more powerful target, the key to success often isn't what you do, but how your target reacts to what you do. Therefore, anticipate your target's response and write it into your script. And so that script is the narrative that they put out in the media for months and months in advance, or in the case of Christian nationalism, for 10 years now at least. And they use that narrative at the opportune moment when you provoke the right reaction to discredit, to discredit and nullify the target that they want to ruin. And then you are not a political opposition anymore because now you're a deplorable or an unvaccinated or somebody nobody should be listening to. They summarize that in the very simple words, the real action is your target's reaction. Let that really percolate. All of their activism is not as important as inducing your reaction to their activism. They poke and poke and poke and poke and poke until you slap their hand. And they catch you on film slapping their hand and say you assaulted them. And if they can get you in court and get you arrested for assault, they will. Doesn't that describe half of what happened in 2020? They put a toe across the line, dare you to say a word, and when you do, they cry, they cry foul. I call it wound collecting. There's a great meme, I should have put a graphic, it's a little colorful, of an activist shoveling a big pile of, it says, opinions on it and throwing it over a fence. And then it shows in the next panel on the cartoon, the fence has shovels up above it and it's throwing it back on her and it's all over her and she says, help, oppression. The opinions um, look like something else that you'd put down the commode, Pastor. Um, wound collecting. They get you to react and they frame it out that they never provoked you in the first place. So how does this work? There's two real ways that they provoke a reaction. One is that they generate a real-time reaction, which is kind of what I was just describing. In other words, they get you to overreact to the scale of what they were doing, or at least frame you to make it look like you overreacted. They're trying to provoke somebody to flip out, act like a fool, start yelling, make a scene, get violent, and then they capture it out of context on film to make you look like the jackass. And that's especially useful when you do something that fulfills one of the stories they've been planting in the media over and over and over and over again. Like somebody losing their marbles and finally smacking a drag queen that's in front of their kid. Oh my God, the rising anti-LGBTQ hate they've been telling us about for two years is real. Holy cow. You'll notice that they provoked a bunch of crazy stuff going on, and so a bunch of people in, in cities went out that happened not to be white and beat up a bunch of Asian people for a couple of years there, and they started a campaign called Stop AAPI Hate because they had all these videos of Asians, primarily Asian women and elderly people, getting attacked in cities, sometimes brutally, some died, and then it was the result of their own policies, but they framed it out that there's these attacks on Asian people, so now we have to create all this stop AAPI hate, and they advance their own agendas off of this by misframing what was going on to make it look like white supremacy was encroaching on, on Asians, which it wasn't white. We had all these other memes we put out as a counter to it where we would, you know, show some kind of a blatantly not white thug of whichever race from the actual scenes and put white supremacy on it because you know, white supremacy comes in many colors these days. We just learned about Latino white supremacy. We have Asian white supremacy. I think we have Jewish white supremacy now. We have all the white supremacies you could possibly imagine. Um, it's a very uh, diverse movement, white supremacy these days. But the goal is to get you to react 
badly. What they say in Beautiful Trouble is a good way to ensure you get a strategically useful reaction from your target is to force them into a decision dilemma where all of their available options play to your advantage. In other words, damned if you do, damned if you don't. There's a technical term for this in political warfare. What you're going to find out if you start digging into this is that there's lots of words for things you've experienced that you didn't know. You're going to discover a gigantic vocabulary for stuff you've been being put through for several years that you didn't know how to respond to because you didn't know there were names for it because you didn't know about political warfare. The technical name for this is mid-level violence or mid-level provocation. So that's mid like middle. It's not a big provocation. It's not a little provocation. It's right in the middle. It's like I said, it's a toe across the line. It's a finger in your face. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. It's a clear provocation, but they technically haven't touched you. It's not big. It's not small. It's in between. So that if you do nothing, you have to humiliate yourself by taking it and doing nothing. But if you do something, no matter what you do, is an overreaction. And you look like a jerk which they capture out of context on camera and make it go viral before you can clear your name. So they give you a false choice between two losing options and create the false impression that your only possible thing you can do is react. And if you don't react the first time, they have another principle I'll talk about later called escalating provocations. So maybe they put a drag queen in a very modest dress for drag queens in front of children and read them genuine story, storybooks. Then maybe the storybooks are a little bit more about racy themes. Then maybe the outfit gets a little racier and skimpier. Maybe they start dancing. Oh, but they're just dancing. That's what the media said. Then maybe the next time they're actually doing sexual gyrations in front of children. Maybe now sex toys are involved and maybe they're actually simulating sex acts in front of children. And this is called an escalating provocation. You didn't take the bait the first time and overreact, so you make it a little hotter. Didn't take it the second time in reaction, they make it a little hotter. Didn't take it again and again and again, it's an escalating provocation that's actually in their guidebook. Provoke, but don't overdo it, you'll lose face with people, you'll lose their trust, then turn up the temperature a little bit each time until you finally get somebody to react, because your reaction is their real action. So that's how you generate a real-time overreaction, and they frame it out that you're the bad guy, and then they move, advance their political agenda the way they want to go. The second one is that they gin up a boogeyman. So they tell everybody in the world that there's a big boogeyman out there of, you know, domestic extremism, domestic terror, white Christian nationalism, whatever. They frame it out. The president goes on TV and says it's the biggest threat facing our nation, even though that's positively ridiculous. You have every corner of the military, you repeat, the biggest threat facing our nation. Every article in the news for months mentions it, and then it kind of fades out for some other thing, but it keeps kind of popping back so that over time it just becomes a social mythology that there's a big bad character out there like the patriarchy or domestic extremism or white nationalism or Christian nationalism that people are vaguely aware of is a rising problem. It's a rising problem. They haven't really seen it themselves, but it's a rising problem. And you've ginned up a boogeyman. And then what you do is create a movement out of that that fulfills their arc. So some people start saying, I am a Christian nationalist. Yes, like Marjorie Taylor Greene. And they say, look, they say it themselves. We've been warning about this. There it is. And they you can build out a whole organized movement that made their lie come true because you stepped into the trap they were laying for you. When this happens, the thing that they are provoking, the boogeyman that they're building out as a movement itself will start to organize and call itself the only solution because it's reaction. And reaction believes that the floor joists are rotted out from under the floor and there are no other options left except to go full demolition and start again under their power, of course. They'll frame out everybody who's trying to, say, advocate for the Constitution or for the rule of law or other less extreme methods as people who want to do nothing or who have no solutions. And they play themselves right into the action-reaction or that thing I talked about with Mao the other day or last night, the friend-enemy distinction. There are friends and there are enemies. And from the other side, there are friends and there are enemies. And the, the, the gulf between those can't be crossed. So you can either provoke a real-time reaction or gin up a movement that's a reaction. And either one of those are reactions that are the left's real action. So I mentioned this friend-enemy distinction. We talked about it with regard to Mao and its effectiveness in polarizing the Chinese people. 
Remember what he said is the people are the people that support the socialist project and the enemies are the people who don't. So the friends are people who are on his, his, his program and the enemies are everybody who's not on his program. And he created this clear distinction. He taught people to hate across a friend-enemy distinction. Friends and enemies are treated very differently in society, whether it's the red class versus the black class, whether it's the people or the enemies of the people. And you teach that hatred across. Well, this happens also with the idea of Christian nationalism. You get this dichotomous choice. You can either be a Christian nationalist or you can say that the most egregious provocations of pride month, season, summer, year, whatever it is now, 365, are good and okay. As a matter of fact, one of the main provocateurs of Christian nationalism, whose last name actually happens to also be Wolf, it's William Wolf, no relation, uh, tweeted recently, he took one of the, shot, the, the pictures of something just, I forget what the detail was, but something really, really out of bounds to most, overwhelmingly most viewers that happened during one of these pride events, and he said, it's this or Christian nationalism. Two choices, that's it. So you're either with us, friends, or you're part of them, enemies. So is this a Christian value? I'll ask you to hate your enemies. Is that what Jesus said? Don't think he said hate your enemies. Think you're supposed to love them and pray for them. It turns out that the friend-enemy distinction is not what Mao called this. You, you recall that he talked about it in terms of the people and enemies of the people. But it was talked about before Mao. I don't know if Mao knew about this guy, but it was developed by a philosopher that is very popular in the Christian nationalist reaction and its broader kind of embedded movement, which is sometimes called the national conservative right. And that philosopher's name is, if we call him a philosopher, he's a jurist, uh, Carl Schmitt. And if you pay attention to these things, you'll start to notice Carl Schmitt's name coming up a lot. You will notice, for example, that when they just did the big thing with the Blaze Media that they were talking about, uh, all of the different candidates, I think this was the thing they did in Iowa, and they had this whole coverage, that they were bragging on social media that the Blaze is now filled with Schmittian thinkers. Because they've been infiltrating institutions too. Carl Schmitt was a grand jurist of the Third Reich under Hitler. He wasn't always a Nazi. He wasn't a, actually, I think he was an opportunistic Nazi. I don't know how committed to Nazism he actually was. It looks like the guy was a scumbag that latched onto whoever had power and followed him around, to be honest with you, having read him. It's almost a little unfair to characterize him as a Nazi because I think he was just latching on to whatever the best thing going was to have looked at his history. He originally came up with this idea, this political philosophy, of two key concepts, the unbound executive and the friend-enemy distinction, while trying to convince uh, Hindenburg to stop both the rise of the Nazi party and the communists in Germany. He realized that Germany was going to fall one way or the other looking at the dynamics and the fight between the fascists and the communists. And he said, the only way we can stop this, and frankly, technically speaking, at that point, he may have been right, I don't know, is to seize executive power and stop both movements which had passed a kind of critical threshold. Maybe he wasn't right. But Hindenburg didn't go along with it. And so Hitler took the chancellorship in 1933, and in a few weeks later, Carl Schmitt joined the Nazis and became one of his jurists. But he summarized these thoughts in a very famous, his most famous book, which came out in 1932, before he was a Nazi. Apparently, he renounced Nazism after it all fell apart later. So I think he was just an opportunist, frankly. Um, not that signing on opportunistically with the Nazis is really this thing to be proud of. Uh, I just don't want to give you this impression that he was necessarily ideologically committed to really anything. But in 1932, he published a book called The Concept of the Political. And the friend-enemy distinction comes from there. And his argument is that all true politics, or real politic, is comprehensible as the intrinsic conflict between friend and enemy. To give him all the credit he can possibly be due on this, he didn't necessarily endorse this idea. He said that it was an inevitability. It's coming anyway. The degraded form of friend-enemy politics is the nature of where politics goes, so we might as well embrace it up front and make use of it. Who are your friends? And Carl Schmitt's friend-enemy distinction, friends 
are the people in a political coalition, at its extreme is what he, he described it, that you would die for. And the enemies are people in a political coalition you would kill. He referred to this as mutual association, mutual disassociation, and mutual enmity across the divide. This is inherently, among whatever else we might talk about it, I'm talking about dialectical political warfare, so I'm going to point out that it is inherently a conflict theory. It inherently brings up two opposites that are intrinsically in a dynamic, working together, or working against one another, that has to complete itself somehow to end that conflict. And so his belief about politics is that it is intrinsically a conflict-bound synthesis of friend and enemy. So I bring you back to the idea that we have an inherently dialectical project in Christian nationalism which has accepted Schmittian thought pretty much whole hog. He also had this idea that a sovereign should be an unbound executive. To be sovereign, in fact, means that you get to decide upon which laws you're exempted from or that your friends are exempted from or when you get to drone strike an American citizen. Oh, that was Obama. Oh, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Same thing. The sovereign gets to decide the exemptions to the law when you get to step outside of the law. And therefore, he is unbound by the law. He's technically, he has this complicated argument that doesn't make any sense. You're technically still bound by the law, but because you're the sovereign, you can step outside the law when you need to. Kind of like where the WHO right now is trying to set up a program where they can declare a crisis shock at any time and take over sovereignty of other nations. They're bound by whatever international law is until the moment that they're not because they need to make an exception. That's what it means to be sovereign for Carl Schmitt. And like I said, you will find if you talk to these Christian nationalist folks or their friends in the national conservatism movement or the integralists that you've been hearing about all day in general, that they are all big fans of executive power. Rather than limiting executive power, they want to increase executive power, which they seem to also be chasing. To, if I make the Gollum reference again, they're chasing the one ring. They see themselves as Gandalf, who can take the ring and put it on and do good in the world without doing what Gandalf said would happen, because Gandalf was wise, is that he would erect himself as a new dark lord in a new dark tower if he was given that power, because it's the corruption of power that is symbolized in the ring. How do we know they like executive power? Well, the name Adrian Vermeule has come up a few times, law professor at Harvard. He is openly an integralist, and at one point he was asked, what do you think of executive power? And he said, yes. They like power. So what this is, is the same program on the different side. My purposes aren't to get too lost in the weeds of any of this part, though. They'll say that I've just abandoned the discussion and the nuance and all that, and I don't care. That this is popular in Christian nationalists and national, conservative, some national conservatism circles is proof that they are reactionary. That's all I need for this. They are definitely not a conservative movement. They are a reactionary movement movement, and thus they are part of the action-reaction dynamic that's our focus tonight. But I'll give you a little extra proof. Remember last night I quoted Hitler, which you're not allowed to do, we're going to quote Hitler again, from Mein Kampf. Gradually, he said, I became an expert in the doctrine of the Marxists and used this knowledge as an instrument to drive home my own firm convictions. I was successful in nearly every case. So Hitler learned how to be Hitler by studying how the Marxists do Marxism and stealing their methods for his philosophy. So now I'll quote from the guy that wrote The Case for Christian Nationalism, Stephen Wolf. On the 20th of May this year, on a tweet he is now deleted, he wrote, I am not conservative because I agree in part with the, quote, critical methodology of the left, but come to different conclusions and valuations. Those sound similar to me. Now let's be real clear though, I am not accusing Stephen Wolf of being like Hitler or a Nazi. I'm saying he's making one of the same mistakes that Hitler made, believing he can take up and wield the dialectical ring of power and use it for good. Everything done with the ring goes bad. It all comes to ruin and destruction. So this is hubris, if I can give Stephen a bridge back from the dark place that he's gone. We all make mistakes. 
So what about Christian nationalism outside of just this dynamic? Well, let's look at three separate cases that it can possibly happen. Three broad cases. It can succeed all the way, it can succeed in part, or it can fail. Those are the only three things that can happen. Of course, succeed in part is on a spectrum, and well, we've got to get a rainbow or something for that. What if it succeeds in total? Now, let me be real clear. That's not likely. I don't think it will. I don't think the American people will put up with it. And from my talking to American people, the reaction I get when I tell them about this Christian nationalism stuff is, why are you even thinking about that? Why are you talking about that? Those people don't have any power. Or, what? Why are they doing that? Why now? We're just finally making progress. Why would they do that? It's a good time if you're playing a dialectical political warfare game and the tides are starting to go the other way, but let's not go there. Nobody's, nobody much outside of certain corners of the conservative Christian church is going to buy onto this. It's very unlikely to succeed short of a military coup, at least not in total. But the model, and sometimes they accept this and sometimes they reject this, is based off of the political articulation in Hegel's book called Philosophy of Right. Right here is in German Recht, which means correctness or rightness. So what is right like right and wrong, but also political right? It's the same basic program that we saw with Mao, but it's slightly different and not quite necessarily as dictatorial. What, he, what Hegel put forth is a constitutional monarchy that has a progressive religion at its heart. The most important thing to know about the Hegelian version is that it's not America. America is not a Hegelian project. We focus on individual liberties, not collectively entering into conflict cycles to drive history to its intended endpoint and enter the promised land that we had in our own mind as we built it out. That's why what you'll hear from the Christian nationalists is that they want to reconstitute America in a new founding. A new founding, which means not America. To reconstitute was very particular wording. As in, our constitution is not adequate, so we need a new one. They want this new picture, whether it's Christian prince or whatever else, to be built off of, whether they fully realize it or not, Hegel's conception of how an ideal state would operate as given in philosophy of right. What he believed, what Hegel believed, is that states are meant to arise in history so that they can go into conflict with one another, then resolve the contradictions within the uh, Weltgeist, the spirit of the world, and then fall away. History is using states and then discards them as history advances itself toward the perfect system. So the goal would be to build a Christian version of this that's in conflict with all the non-Christian things. And then that dialectic across Christendom versus non-Christendom or mere Christendom versus whatever else can start to play out. Meanwhile, internally, the dialectic is working to concentrate power. This is where Mao said, remember, there are contradictions between the people and the enemies, and then there's contradictions among the people. They're a fundamentally different character. What he was saying is there's a big picture dialectic, friend versus enemy, and then within friends, there's an, an, another dialectic to concentrate the belief system onto one set of ideals. And so ultimately, this is why this is a Hegelian project, whether they believe it or not. So using dialectical methods to concentrate toward an idealistic Christian, pan-Protestant belief system that's going to create a state that will be in conflict with all the other states so that we can figure out how the world's supposed to be. Maybe it's all going to become Christian. I don't know what that means for a nation, but um, that's a philosophical question outside of my scope for this purposes. They want to build, in other words, a Christian version of the same system that the left wants. I'm not calling them Maoists. I'm saying that they want a system that's modeled the same way. There are friends and there are enemies, and there's a dialectic between them that plays out on the grand scale, and within the, co the category of friends, there's another dialectic that works to concentrate the ideology of the people inside. Everybody's got to get more and more on the same page. Where I first ran into the phrase, and so the dialectic progresses, and so this is how the dialectic goes, was reading the book Critical Race Theory and Introduction by Richard Delgado. And he has this section where he says, well, we had, you know, critical race theory, and then we started to work in feminism, and then we started to work in, well, there's specific races. There's Hispanic crit, Latin crit, um, Asian crit, and all these other 
forms of critical race theory that are, well, you know, what's the difference between, you know, in critical race terms between being Hispanic and being black? Where does that fall in this pr privilege oppression hierarchy? And he said that these create all these important con conversations and discussions and advance our political agenda and our understanding and get everybody on the same intersectional page. And then he finishes the paragraph, and so the dialectic progresses. That's the internal dialectic. That's consolidating power within is what that is. That's the unity criticism, unity formula that Mao laid out as a matter of fact. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, the first question, we're gonna have a lot of questions we have to ask ourselves is, how long is that gonna last? How long is it gonna work? Why do I ask that question? Why is that my first real question about these people? How long is their mirror image system going to last? Because when it fails, the system's already in place for the left to step in and take all the power and you've already lost your constitution, so you don't have that to fall back on to stop them the second time. After almost every, if not every, reactionary movement that succeeded in taking power in Europe and South America, the left has come back and the communists have taken power again. You get rid of individual rights, you get rid of protections for liberty, and the next thing that comes along is a bunch of mad people that got oppressed under a right-wing government. The left is so good at saying the right, the right, Franco, whoever, so bad, that's the cause of all of our problems. The left gets the moral authority for a century, and you're on the march straight back to communism, but you've also lost all of your protections that you had before you decided to come in with an iron fist in the first place. The left is better than anybody in history as a general rule at stealing moral authority. And they will steal it from this. So how long is that going to last? Build the system, wait till they steal it. Great plan, guys. But then, how are you going to make sure that it stays Christian? I mean, there's going to be people within it that aren't necessarily going to agree. You know the left is going to try to subvert it. How do you know it's going to stay doctrinally correct? Well, you're going to you use a social credit system. You could install one of those. You could maybe create local currencies that are digital and controlled and make sure that only friends can use them and enemies can't. You know, all the different tools the left is building to build a system of control, those are possible options. You could go full Amish. Good luck when the tank shows up. I guess you can be an Amish with an AR, but I don't know exactly if that's quite what they do. More concerningly than the Hegelian aspects, though, are the other aspect that matches what we see in not necessarily communism, but in the modern neo-Marxist identity Marxist, Marxist policies, which is folkish nationalism. Now, the left gets really upset when I point out that what they have created is something folkish. There are folks. Have you noticed they like that word? They use that word a lot. Folks, 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 white folks, black folks, gay folks, queer folks. It's gender neutral, so you can say folks. They use the word folks a lot. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a book in 1903 that became considered the basis for what became critical race theory a century later called The Souls of Black Folk. He saw the blacks as a folk, as a nation, you know, like people in place, which is what Stephen Wolf characterizes a nation as, people in place. So black people are a folk, according to W.E.B. Du Bois. Where did W.E.B. Du Bois get that idea? Germany. In the late 1800s, in 1893, 4, it's been a few minutes since I've read, he actually went to Germany to try to do a PhD, and he ended up not finishing his PhD there. I don't know what the circumstances were. He finished it at Harvard, became the first black PhD from Harvard a couple of years later, before 1900. But he studied primarily Herder while he was there, and folkish nationalism. The idea that the Germans are a folk, and that you could unite the 300 disparate states in Germany or Prussia at the time under a folkish identity. Same language, the Germanic language, same songs, same culture, generally speaking, we're a folk. And we have one folk, ein folk. One program, one Reich, ein Reich, with one leader, ein Führer. The same idea fuels, this is, this is the heart of why you have folks at the heart of all the woke language. They think of themselves as a people with a culture. They think of themselves ethnically, 
queer culture is a thing. You know what one of their main publications for the LGBTQ lobby is? LGBTQ Nation. What do they fly everywhere? Flags! They have a flag for every sexuality you can possibly think of and more. They even have a pedophile flag. Why do they have flags? Why do they fly them over the American flag and over the other nation flags? Because they're a colonizing nation. Because they think of themselves as a folk, a kind of people who are bound together by a shared culture, which is exactly the definition of nation that Stephen Wolf gives in A Case for Christian Nationalism. The identity politics will play out through doctrine in Christian nationalism in exactly the same way that it plays out in identity Marxism, although with the critical methodologies adapted to Stephen Wolf or somebody else's valuations and conclusions, as he phrased it. This leads us to ask a lot more questions. If we're going to have a total win, that was the presupposition here for this part of the, the, the talk, of Christian nationalism, that we're going to become a full U.S. Christian nation, or as actually Stephen Wolf put it, North America, Christian nation, we have a lot of questions to ask. Pastor John raised that earlier, that I asked a lot of hard questions about it. So the first one, of course, is whose doctrine are we going to follow? I, as a somewhat outsider, have noticed that you have some disagreements amongst you. Amongst you. And I mean doctrinal disagreements, not necessarily nasty disagreements. You can't figure out, are we supposed to baptize at this or at that? I'm not going to get into the details of that. That's a big one. People argue about this. Which one's it going to be in Christian nation? Is it going to be Catholic or Protestant? That's a big one. You think that the Catholic integralists are just going to let the Protestants have this one? You think they're just going to let that slide by? You think the Protestants are going to let that happen the other way around? Mm -hmm. Which one's it going to be? So is it going to be Baptist or Presbyterian? Methodist, maybe? Unitarian. Oh, wait. That's woke. What about the Mormons? Will it be Jewish? Are there room for Jews or Mormons? Jehovah's Witnesses? Christian scientists? We already heard what Stephen Wolf said. There won't be atheists, so we know it's not that. So we heard earlier from Stephen Wolf that we know that this is a question that has to be asked straight from his book. I'll quote him again. But granting religious liberty, he said, to all orthodox Christians, so let's put a highlighter over the word orthodox, granting religious liberty, who gets religious liberty in Christian nationalism? Granting religious liberty to all orthodox Christian, if deemed suitable, would effectively end dissension, as I've defined it, and create a sort of pan-Protestant civil society. This is precisely what I hope for future arrangements in North America. So orthodox Christians who are deemed suitable are the ones who have religious liberty. We can presuppose that just like Mao said that civil rights only extend to the people and not to the enemies of the people, that maybe a people outside of Orthodox Christians, if deemed suitable, don't have so many civil rights. Doesn't that remind us of Mao? Not to have a correct political orientation is, not, is like not having a soul. That's a Mao quote. We start with a desire for unity and distinguish right from wrong through criticism and struggle to arrive at a new unity on a new basis. That was Mao. So I'm not saying that Stephen Wolf is a Nazi. I'm also not saying that he's a Maoist. I'm just saying that tyranny is tyranny and Christian nationalism is tyranny. We have to ask the questions about this. Who are these suitable Orthodox Christians and how are we going to know who they are? Who are unsuitable? More importantly, let's get to the nitty gritties, the ugly parts, the parts that after what we just went through with COVID should scare the shit out of you. Got your attention now, didn't I? What government department will be empowered to decide who counts and who doesn't as suitable Orthodox Christians? Department of Homeland Security? You want to give it to them? Will that change? Is it going to be pan-Protestant until they decide there's big enough doctrinal disputes with the people who baptize at the wrong time and they get kicked out? So it's you know, not quite as pan as it was before? We know that this is a valid question, and here's how you know this is a valid question. Do you think for one second that they will let woke churches have religious liberty? No. You know they won't. In fact, they say, those aren't Christian, those are heresies. I don't disagree with them that that's a heresy, but I question their authority to make that judgment for other faiths. 
So we know they will exclude Christians based on doctrinal disputes. We know that if a perhaps particular denomination makes a decision that they disagree with, that they decide is woke, by the way, they think not hating gay people is woke, that that's going to be a problem. So what if it gets turned backwards later? What if they build this apparatus of suitable Orthodox Christians or the only ones with religious liberty, and then somehow you end up with another leftist in power? You end up with a regime like we have under Biden. The only churches you're going to have are woke at that point. Good luck fixing it. You don't have a First Amendment anymore to appeal to. You lost it. You gave it away so you could have your fear-based solution to the problem. So we asked which government department will decide who gets to have the power to decide suitable orthodoxy, which three-letter agency is going to enforce it. How are they going to enforce it? Well, the softest way that I can think of is the most effective way. You just have to make a social credit system attached to the allowable doctrines and make sure that the people are proving that they're doctrinally correct or at least pretending to be in public so that they can participate in civil life. Wouldn't it be neat if they use that as an excuse to build a digital currency and social credit system so they can make sure only the right Christians can participate in the economy that they built to exclude the woke people, and then whoops, they decide to flip the switch later, and now it's just the regular social credit system? Wouldn't that be funny? Ha <laughs> ha. Here's another important question. In fact, you guys, if you want anything at all, this is the most important question. You should write this one down. This is the question you should always ask when you see something that's not passing the sniff test on tyranny. Most important question, very simple question. What will you do with people who say no. You ever heard of that thing called the Jewish question? The Jews, the Jews have an absolutely uncompromising position on their relationship with God. So when somebody comes along and says, you're not going to do that, they say, no, we're going to do whatever we want. We're going we're to follow our religion. That becomes a problem. And that's why you can tell that a lot of totalitarian states end up having problems with Jews. It's a great sniff test. They have an absolutely uncompromising relationship to where they'll just leave. Diaspora is not new for Jews. Yep, all right, we're out. You say we can't do that here, we're going somewhere else. Their commitment to God is complete and total if they're observant, and the state will not take it over. Big problem for tyrants. So what are you going to do with people who say no? What will the Christian nationalists do with Jews who say no? No, I will not hold myself to Christian, Protestant, whatever, while in public. I have my own observances and obligations that I have to keep. My Sabbath is on this day. It's not on that day. You're not going to make me change what I do. What do you do with the people who say no? What do you do with the people like me or the pastor? Who are, we're going to say no. No, I don't want to live under your stupid system. I got told what they'll do with me. They told me they're going to bend my knee. I told them I will bend their knee backwards. That's a very important question. What will you do with people who say no? Ask it every time you suspect tyranny is in the works. What will the woke do with people who say no? Struggle session. What will the Christian nationalists do with people who say no? Well, we heard from Stephen Wolf's book earlier, we can banish them, we can exile them, or we can deprive them of their property, or we can kill them. These could be capital crimes, he said in his book. At the very least, I suspect they'll do the same thing the woke do already. The new system, the new way, the new passive aggressive, if I might use a colorful term, bitch way to deal with this, is to make it suck not to participate in the new system. Tyranny in the 21st century is opt in. You don't have to. Nobody shows up with a gun and says, you're going to sign up for the vaccine passport. You just can't do anything until you do. Enjoy your miserable life off the grid that gets harder and harder and harder and harder. At any time, all you got to do is come down, put yourself in the system, and you have your bank account back. We'll make it real easy for you. You don't even have to carry money or credit cards. Just scan your phone, scan your hands, scan your forehead. You can pay. You can walk in and out of a store, pick stuff up. Nobody even says it. Nobody's there. You just get stuff, and it, you get it to, to, taken out of your account, no problem. Make it very easy, very convenient if you play ball. Make it very uncomfortable if you don't. Christian nationalists could do the same thing. You know? You can live in our society, you can worship as you will at home, but when you're in public, you're going to follow all of our rules and you're not going to be allowed to shop at these stores. You're not be, the whole system could be set up the same way to pressure people into conversion for convenience. Yeah, that's exactly what the gospel teaches. 
you know, believe for convenience. So your life will be easier. That's why you should believe. That's pretty much exactly the message of the Bible, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's the way tyranny works in the future. It's passive-aggressive. They're not going to force you, the, well, they might later, but for the, now, for the period now with social credit looming, they don't have to force you to do something. They just make your life miserable until you participate. They make it harder and harder and harder and harder until you get on board. That's pretty much effectively what Stephen Wolf said is going to be the condition for people who resist the Christian national regime in his books. Atheists will be stamped out, the wrong kinds of beliefs will be stamped out, blah, 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 exile, the whole thing. If they can deprive you of your life, your liberty, or your property, which is the core philosophy of America, that those things are inalienable rights, if they can alienate you from them, they can make you pretend to believe whatever they want you to, making life extremely uncomfortable for you. So a last question to ask, is this American at all? Well, of course it's not. They want to reconstitute the nation in a new founding. When you reconstitute a nation, it's not the same nation anymore. This isn't rocket science. It's a new nation. The constitution of a nation tells you what the nation is. It's the definitional document of the nation. So you get a new constitution, a new founding, you have a new nation. So the thing, they might call it America. They might call it Christian America. They might call it the CSSR or something, or A, I guess. Who knows? But it's not America. America was constituted in 1789. That's when it was constituted. If it's not that constitution, it's not America. But we have good reasons to believe that this is absolutely not American. I'll give you an example. On May 25th, I was with Mike. We were in D.C. at an event, which is a very fortuitous time to have done this. It turned out to be very funny. Uh, I tweeted the following. See if you disagree with this very controversial tweet, because this was a very controversial tweet. I said, the U.S. Constitution, preambled by the Declaration and bolstered by the Bill of Rights, if defended by an American people who support it, is the best defense against any tyranny man can devise against his fellow man and is the greatest impediment to the global Marxist agenda. Is that an offensive tweet to an American audience? Well, the Christian nationalists went bonkers. Within like two minutes, they were tweeting back, failed document. I retweeted it today to see what happened within two minutes. Failed document. The floor joists have rotted out. These are the people that want to teach the world about faith. They have none. I also got a large, I mean, I got thousands of responses to this, angry responses to this immediately. People were shocked at this very conservative uh, conference that I was at. And I was trying to tell them about the Christian national thing that it was all embroiled in. I didn't have to tell them. I just show them the tweet and they said, oh, yeah, I like that tweet. And I'm like, look at the responses. And they said, holy crap, what is wrong with these people? I didn't know it was like that. A lot of them quoted a character called Lysander Spooner. You'll hear Spooner quoted by these people a lot. They got favorite quotes from, you know, lots of people. This one is, but whether the Constitution really be one thing or another, this much is certain, that it has either authorized such a government as we have had or has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. That's their attitude toward the United States Constitution. So who was Lysander Spooner? You going to be surprised to find out he's a leftist? <laughs> of course he won't. He was an individualist anarchist, Unitarian. He was considered for 19th century purposes, late 19th century purposes, a left libertarian. He was a member of the International Working Men's Association, which was also called the First International, which got infiltrated, taken over by the communists who threw out all the anarchists and became the Second International, which was headquartered in Moscow. The Third International coordinated Stalin and created Mao Zedong, the precursor to the Communist Party International, is who they quote, a member of that. Strange guy to choose to quote about how our Constitution is unfit because it allowed our government to overstep its bounds. They also quote John Adams a lot, and I've heard this quote a couple times today. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people and wholly inadequate to the governance of any other. I actually kind of like that our Constitution in that sense is minimal. It restrains the government, but it doesn't outline, say, like the state Constitution of Oklahoma, which was written during the Progressive Era and is something like 400 pages long, detailing even like the cost of propane per ounce or something like that. I'm glad we have a minimalist Constitution and that does require at least a moral and decent people, 
whether religious or not. This was John Adams' opinion. So they like to bring this up. They like to say this is why we need a Christian nation. They quote John Adams on this, one of our founders, second president, great friend, argumentative friend. They had falling out, came back together, whatever, with Thomas Jefferson, a very central American figure. You don't get much more central than John Adams. And so I went, I did my due diligence. I actually went to a conference where there was a panel about Christian nationalism. Stephen Wolf was on this panel. I listened to them speak, and I listened to them field questions. Just another little data point in your, uh, your, your, your Excel file here on Christian nationalism. When it came time for questions, almost every person in the room raised their hand. Very vigorously. And one of the first questions was from a lady who quoted something from Jefferson and quoted something from Madison, I think from memory, and said that's a little bit at odds with the characterization, not that Stephen gave, but this historian on the panel had quoted Adams. And the reply was, we consider Jefferson and Madison to be an extremist fringe among the founders. We refer to that as Virginia supremacy, and the United States isn't necessarily to be bound by Virginia supremacy. So I remind you of what these two gentlemen did in terms of the United States. Thomas Jefferson, in case you forgot your civics and your history from second grade, wrote the Declaration of Independence. James Madison wrote the Constitution. That's Virginia supremacy. These are not people who are friendly to the United States Constitution. Now, incidentally, they mention this quote from Adams, and I don't have a problem with this quote from Adams. I like to contemplate this quote from Adams, but I do like to add relevant color to this quote from Adams in light of Christian nationalism. Normally, I don't care, but the Christian nationalists are using it to promote their ideas about how our nation should be constituted, so I think we should understand who John Adams was when he said this. Does anybody know what John Adams' religious affiliation was? John Adams was a Congregationalist, which is the precursors to a Unitarian. He was a Unitarian. He did not believe in the divinity of Jesus. He rejected the Trinity. He would not be welcome in the Christian nation. I'm fine with the quote, but let's not be hypocrites. Let's not bear false witness when we put it into service. So the question that's really at the bottom of what if Christian nationalism could take over completely is are we really willing to give away America in order to save America? And does that make any sense at all? So what if it succeeds in part? Well, that's what they call the big sort, the national divorce. All the red states become really red, all the blue states become really blue, everybody moves to where, because moving is no big deal, right? You have family, some of them are old, so it's really expensive, it's complicated, no big deal. Everybody should just move to whichever state matches their you know, preferred political color, even though most states cut pretty close to the 50% 50, 50 line in how they vote. We'll just move, we'll balkanize and build, said Andrew Torba the founder of Gab, who wrote also a book with Andrew Isker about Christian nationalism. This is a divide and conquer strategy operating from within. It's basically the same thing as total victory, but on smaller scales, like micro states instead of a nation, micro nations instead of a nation. This is a balkanized country into different Christian denominational autonomous zones or whatever we want to call them. I'm sure that the, you know, the U.S. writ large, the Democrat-run U.S. writ large, where all the conservatives lump themselves into, say, the upper Cumberland on the border of Tennessee and Kentucky, are just going to say, yeah, 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 guys, just go make your own nation, no big deal. We'll just let you do that. No problem. Religious liberty, guys, even though you're saying that you're not part of the U.S. anymore. It's like they forgot what Abraham Lincoln did when people left the U.S., You're just going to have regional, a regional version of the same thing. You're going to have several folk nations that are now going to be united across kind of a loose, some kind of agreement of pan-Protestant or whatever intersectional Christian banner across the broader nation. It's the same thing as the woke, basically, but with Christian doctrines and denominations. Just like I said before, they have a CRT nation, they have race nations, they have queer nation, they have LGBTQ nation, they have post-colonial nationalism trying to take over uh, throughout Europe and so on, and so the dialectic progresses. Same thing here. But this is definitely divide and conquer the possibilities are overwhelming, obvious. Um, imagine if you could, that you were to g gather all of your enemies, say, in one small geographical area like the Upper Cumberland, and while they're politically disorganized, trying to get themselves together and get themselves constituted and whatever, I don't know, we like to pretend that war ended because we've had a long peace here on our soil, but we're dealing with some pretty ruthless guys. 
I'll remind you what is something I said last night, how the communists before the Depression in the 1920s were running a campaign in the United States to initiate black nationalism intentionally to try to segregate the South off and get it to split and create its own black nation. Why? Because it would split the United States apart. That was a communist strategy until the Great Depression struck and made job conditions so severe that a whole bunch of people in the South, a bunch of black people in the South moved to northern cities in order to get jobs under the really strict conditions. And people were too mixed in terms of their races in each geographical area to be able to split a chunk off like they had intended in the first place. So what we have currently is a place where we're politically mixed. We have red states with blue cities. The blue cities themselves often have red strongholds. They're actually, a lot of them are quite purple. So we're going to encourage people to move out of those, concentrate themselves in defined geographical areas, and then plant a flag and take a stand. <laughs> and my notes literally just say, ha ha. I know what I would do if I was, say, a global tyranny that was going to destroy those people. I roughly know how carpet bombing works. So you can get all the Christians to self-segregate themselves denominationally into little pods in different places, and you know where they all are, and if you really wanted to, you could finally build that wall around them and lock them in. Such a great idea, this balkanize, that's the balkanize part, and build that Andrew Torba is saying. Now, why in the world would Andrew Torba say that we should balkanize and build? That's literally a newsletter he put out from the Gab newsletter. Somehow I got signed up for it. Maybe when he sees the video, it'll take me off of it. I'm somehow on their newsletter. I get it in my email. It's like the best spy work I'd ever tried to do. I think somebody tried to harass me, and they signed me up for the newsletter. It's great. So what does this mean? We're going to break everything apart and create these autonomous regions, doctrinally consistent. Maybe they have social credit systems so they don't let the riffraff in. Maybe the Democrats get mad and build a wall around them. I don't know what they do. What this is is the idea that the floor joists really are rotted out. That it's all lost. That's Actually, if you read Torba in good faith, that's what he actually says. He says that things are that bad, this is our only option, and the regime at large is going to collapse under its own stupidity and its own evil and its own weight. It's going to collapse. And so what we have to do is get into our own places and start to build up a remnant that will be able to emerge and build the new society when it falls apart. It's a kind of an extension of what's called the Benedict Option, which is outlined by Rod Dreher, for example. The idea is that we've already lost, which I think these people have nothing to teach us about faith if they believe we've already lost. They doubt God's timing. I think that's pretty embarrassing. They never read Esther. They don't know such a time as this. It's pretty embarrassing. But at any rate, the idea is that we have to hole up like in the monasteries, the Benedictine monasteries, and we have to preserve the culture because we're in a dark age now. So we're going to hole up and hide the culture, and later when things get better, we can emerge and bring it back. So that's like balkanize and preserve. Torba says balkanize and build so that they can seize the space of the vacuum that's created when the regime collapses. And that one might assume means he presumes that the woke regime will collapse soon. That whatever the World Economic Forum and the United Nations are building out doesn't have a long lifespan ahead of us, so we need to just get ready to weather the storm and come out of our bunkers uh, in a few years, which obviously they'll just let us have and everything will be fine while we balkanize and build. But I want to know how long he thinks we're going to be able to hide from the thing the World Economic Forum and the United Nations is building. Remember that the Soviet Union lasted for 69 years before it collapsed. The CCP is still going strong at 74 years old this year in October. And when will the CCP collapse, or will it collapse at all? How is it going to collapse? All that's unclear. There are ways that it could. There are things that we could be doing. We're not doing any of them. We're doing kind of the opposite. So I assume that this balkanize and build program means we're going to hide through all of that, however long it lasts. And then there's this idea of this moving apart, whether it's on Christian nationalist terms or just political terms, overall, the so-called big sort, which is being encouraged by a lot of people, some of whom I'm friends with and really like. People that are in red states, or people who are conservative need to get to red states, they need to get out of blue cities in particular. I actually believe in a project I sometimes call the 50 Stars Project, because we're going to keep all 50 stars on the flag, it's not that complicated of a project. We're going to fight in the blue states, we're going to fight in the purple states, we're going to fight in the fake red states, we're going to fight also in the real red states. But there's this movement called the Big Sort. We're going to move, and I just want to tell you about the Big Sort. We're going to move everybody to where they're in, you know, closer to the people that have their values, we don't have to worry. 
You don't have to worry about these trans trafficking laws. Get yourself out of California. Get your kids out of California. And I seriously sympathize with that threat. And that's in something like 12 or 13 states now. But what this is, is building out intentionally polarized environments and let people sort themselves into political communities that are more and more and more homogenous. Kind of like how the parties became more and more homogenous. You don't have conservative Democrats or liberal Republicans anymore. And look how that's working out. That's very polarized. And the, the truth is that the big sort increases polarization. And there was a book in 2008 by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort that explains this concept and the problems that come with it. And they're trying to figure out something you can do about it. Well, Bill Bishop doesn't give a solution in this book. And he's a describer. He's not saying we should big sort. He was describing the phenomenon that was already happening. Richard Florida is a man who came along in 2009 and wrote another book and saw the big sort as a problem. And he described the big sort not by that name, but by the same concept. And he said it causes serious polarization. And it causes privation. It causes people to be... Uh, some people richer, some people poorer, there's more inequality, and that's a big problem. So he pro proposed a solution to the big sort in the book he wrote in 2009. The title of that book was The Great Reset, which is the first time that term got used. So the solution to the big sort is the Great Reset. So in other words, if you can't get the Great Reset by the front door, you get all the conservatives to initiate a big sort and get it as the solution to the problem. You know, problem, reaction, solution. The problem is look at all this polarization after we had a big sort. The sort was the reaction, what are we gonna do? Solve it, how? Great reset. Rethink how we build out our cities, our states, our regions, everything. Everywhere, all at once. So what if Christian nationalism loses, which is of course what it's going to do. It's probably in fact an operation meant to lose because we have no reason to believe it's going to succeed with an American people that can't figure out why in the world it's happening at all. What do we have to see it as if it loses? Which it will. Then it must be a trap. It's either stupid or a trap, or some of both. The goal, if you ask me from a dialectical political warfare position what the point of the great or sorry, what the point of the Christian nationalist movement is, is in fact to nullify independent Christianity. Now I have to talk to you about January 6th. I have a picture of the January 6th document. In March 2022, speaking before, and I'll say this as Trump would, before the House Unselect Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol, an attorney for the Freedom From Religion Foundation by the name of Andrew Seidel submitted testimony, including a 56-page report, which you see one page of on the screen there, seeking to prove the cause of the alleged insurrection at the Capitol. And in fact, the cause he identified is, well, you're going to be surprised that it's Christian nationalism. It's not even Trump. The Christian nationalist movement that nobody's paying attention to is, in fact, in this 56-page report delivered to the committee, the real cause of January 6th insurrection, the worst attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor and since Mount Vesuvius exploded and whatever else happened, since the moon fell out of the sky. So here's what Andrew Seidel says at the beginning, at the very opening. is, Dear Chairperson Thompson and members of the select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Christian nationalism is the biggest threat to America today, an existential threat to a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. I delivered that warning to a room full of reporters at the Religion News Association Conference in Las Vegas on September 19th, 2019, and 475 days later, on January 6th, 2021, Christian nationalists proved me right. Remember that whole thing I said they build out a story for a long time and then all of a sudden they use an event and say it came true? They attacked our capital, our democracy, <laughs> our democracy, our nation, and you. You're speaking to Congress. Christian nationalism was the banner under which the seemingly disparate groups united that day. The ideology provided the moral and mental permission structure Americans needed to assail American democracy. He goes on to say, my testimony will lay out the undeniable evidence showing that Christian nationalism played a central role in the insurrection, both in the lead up to the insurrection and on January 6th itself. What do you think the federal government thinks about the 
January, or about the Christian nationalist movement. What do you think they think about it? Let's hear from Mr. Seidel again. Christian nationalism was the central driving force on January 6th. The attackers were not shy about declaring their motivations. They held Bibles aloft, prayed in the Senate, carried Christian flags, openly confessed to their motivations on video. The many disparate identities and ideologies visible during the attack were united under a banner of Christian nationalism, which created the permission structure necessary for Americans to attack their own government. We'll zoom in a little bit here. That Christian flag, there on, uh, I guess you're right, was carried into battle against, against America, was carried alongside the Confederate flag. See how they do guilt by association? And this, unfortunately, is an association they won't have a hard time reifying or making real. Unfortunately, many of the so-called Christian nationalists are also quasi-quiet, not really all that quiet about their neo-Confederate beliefs as well. It was carried against the police officers protecting the beating heart of our democracy. The terrorists didn't just parade the flag on the battle lines opposite Hodges. They carried that Christian flag onto the floor of the United States Senate. They attacked, they conquered, they paraded their flag on vanquished ground, and then they said a prayer to Jesus in that Senate. We cannot understand what happened on January 6th without understanding Christian nationalism nor can we hope to prevent a more serious repeat without confronting the danger of Christian nationalism. So that's what the feds think about this movement. That all sounds pretty bad. So how does Andrew Seidel define Christian nationalism? We go back to the very first thing I said about Christian nationalism. Nobody knows what it means. How does he define it? Roughly as vaguely as the Christians doing Christian nationalism, actually. He says, Christian nationalism is an identity built on the claim that America was founded as a Christian nation, that it was based on Judeo-Christian principles. I don't know what Judeo-Christian is, but okay. And mostly, that's with an A, not Judeo, Judea, Christian principles. And most importantly, that we have strayed from that foundation, from our godly roots. Christian nationalism employs the language of return in an effort to claim to be the true heirs of the American experiment, and more importantly, the American identity. In their retelling, Christian nationalists are the true Americans. Everyone else is an interloper. In other words, a friend-enemy distinction. True Americans versus enemies or interlopers who are not, are not true Americans. So his definition, in fact, if you actually read the document, which I'm not going to bore you by reading tons and tons of it, is really, really broad. It's so broad that even a public official giving a prayer or somebody, it doesn't even have to be an official. I shouldn't make you think it's like a congressperson. Even somebody like Eric Metaxas, who is a whole page dedicated to him in this document, giving a prayer at a meal that would go something like, Lord, bless this food to our bodies and bless this nation in Jesus' name, amen, would constitute being Christian nationalist. Anybody who said that is a Christian nationalist. If you bless the nation and pray to Jesus, you're a Christian nationalist, according to his very expansive definition. So you can guess, they're not just going to limit it to the radicals being weirdos and writing these books and being activists online or wherever else. They're going to try to scoop up Christians writ large. Sadly, too many Christians in this country effectively agree with some of these things. You have to understand this term has been and is being very actively weaponized by the government. Please don't fall for this. What I just did, according to the Christian nationalists, is attacking Christians. So what does Seidel propose as solutions to this clear and present danger to U.S. democracy? Well, he gives two. Number one, investigate Christian nationalism as a potential threat to the, to the nation. And two, recommit to the separation of state and church. That's how he phrases it, backwards from usual. If we take a close look, we can see him marrying truth and a lie, can't we? We also can see a manipulation to power over our elected leaders. Here's what he says. First, this committee must investigate the role of Christian nationalism played in fomenting and justifying this attack. This committee cannot ignore Christian nationalism or treat it with timorous indifference simply because there are religious aspects to this identity. See that establishment clause thing? Here's how you get around it. Of course, government officials must be careful to not trespass on true religious freedom, but we must be just as careful not to go too far in the other direction. 
We must not ignore genuine threats for fear of the false cries of persecution. An unwillingness to investigate and discuss Christian nationalism as a driver of this attack for whatever reason only increases the likelihood of a repeat attack. Christian nationalism is an existential threat to the American Republic, and if we do not confront that fact, we are unlikely to survive it. Second, the United States needs a national recommitment to the separation of state and church, and this must begin with our elected leaders. Wow, couldn't you probably take a really expansive view of that and exclude Christians from public office, maybe? Or certainly constrain any way that they behave while in office, nothing informed by their religion, no statements of faith. So believing elected leaders, if this were to be actualized, could have reins put on them to control how they are, how they govern, how they act, how they relate to their constituents. And he bases this actually, of all things, on Article 6, Clause 3 in the Constitution, that there is to be no religious test for public office, so therefore anybody professing religion is failing that provision in the Constitution. There is the truth married to a lie that is a power-grabbing lie, as a matter of fact. But more importantly, or maybe less importantly, but very importantly, Christian nationalism must also be investigated as an existential threat to the nation. What did he say? America is a shared idea, and Christian nationalism refuses to share. If you read Stephen Wolfe's book, it turns out that's true. Isn't that unfortunate? Has the right ever seen a hole in the ground dug by the left that it didn't say, wow, a hole, and jump face first into? Christian nationalism refuses to share. It excludes non-Christians and the wrong kinds of Christians. America will never be a Christian nation because the moment it becomes a Christian nation, it will cease to be America. The two cannot peacefully coexist. One will triumph. Doesn't that sound dialectical, conflicty? This is the choice we face as a nation, Christian nationalism or America. We cannot have both. And the trouble is, this is another truth married to a lie, but a lot of that has already been made true by the movement. So this brings us to talk about the nullified independent churches thing, the future of the American church. I want to tell you what the future of your churches are going to look like if the dialectical political warfare that's weaponizing the Christian nationalist movement is allowed to proceed. Three cases like before. If Christian nationalism succeeds in full, there will be no independent churches because they'll be under the dictate of the Christian prince. So there'll be no religious liberty. Speakers all day talked about that. There'll be one church that'll be some probably pan-Protestant or ecumenical coalition of churches, a national council of churches next to the world council of churches maybe, that'll be under state magisterial control. There are harder line definitions. Who knows what those will do? Maybe it's Stephen Wolf will get his vision. The rule of the least tolerant still applies. The most radical people usually take power once you start stripping people of individual rights, so it will tend more radical over time. So what we see is that religious liberty will be sacrificed for safety. The same trade of liberty for safety that the woke always appeal to, Christian nationalists are doing the same thing. Give us your liberty, we'll give you security. You guys, you deserve neither. So the, lim- the range of acceptable belief will be delimited in law. We lose the Constitution. There's no way they could stop the woke churches without being able to limit religious freedom. There's no way they could stop liberation theology without limiting religious freedom. The corruption will come with time, and we see that there's a great reset apparatus that's built to enforce how that will work, that the left could seize at any falter of their power, any rebellion by the people they could take advantage of, any squeeze from the international forces that are going to oppose it. The international community will not stand to watch a radical rightist movement take over the nuclear weapons arsenal of the United States, by the way. They will not stand to watch that happen without a a response. So what if it succeeds in part? There will be no independent churches in the localities. There will be different denominations in different places, but there will be no religious liberty within any one of them. If you want religious, more religious liberty, you move somewhere else. So you'll have regional doctrinal zones that are a balkanized version of what we just talked about previously. Religious liberty becomes a function of location if they allow space for that at all. 
a fragmented country with different doctrinal microstates within it descends into a Hegelian religious dialectical conflict. The big sort proceeds and the great reset comes along as the answer to the problem. We'll probably see them build something like a social credit system to keep it doctrinal. They'll build out the architecture that we've weaponized against them later. This is just like John Benzinger talked about earlier. Will we have to dissolve the United States, have a national divorce, in any case, nullify parts or all of the Constitution? We introduce the divide and conquer problem. None of this will be allowed to be set up in peace. We lose while getting organized, probably, if we go in on it. What if it fails, which is most likely, this is the most important example, uh, case, nullification of independent churches. This is what it's really about. There will still be church after the Great Reset or the Agenda 2030. There will definitely still be church. There will not be independent church. There will not be independent thought. There will not be independent speech. There will not be independent belief. There will definitely still be church. There will need no religious liberty. The reaction cycle will turn into the excuse moving upward in the spiral to take away religious liberty. Up in the spiral of the Christian nationalist movement, dialectic, is taking away your religious liberty. We're being goaded into this by wolves in sheep's clothing. So what does nullification mean? What does a nullified church look like? Nullification is a terrible state to be in. Nullification is not censorship. It's not execution. It's kind of worse. When you're nullified, you are either, in the best case scenario, now irrelevant. You're a basket of deplorables. Nobody has to listen to you. You're an anti-vaxxer. Your scientific opinions are not going to be considered. We need to get misinformation and disinformation you publish out of the scene. That's the best case scenario if you're nullified. Nothing you say makes any impact because you've been politically removed from the boundaries of polite discourse. More to the point, nullified actually means that you become counterproductive if you do anything right. If you are a man and you stand up to protect your children, that's toxic masculinity because men have been nullified by feminism. It's actually worse when men stand up so long as the feminist hegemony rules over our country. The question is, why are there so many moms fighting back? Where are the men? They're nullified. A lot of us men know, we know deep down that if we do anything that resembles masculine behavior whatsoever, it'll get captured on camera, turned into toxic masculinity, and we're going to get, we're going to make matters worse for whatever cause we're standing up for. We know it implicitly, even if we don't know it explicitly. We're nullified by toxic masculinity. During the white fragility struggle sessions, we were nullified by the accusation of complicity and racism. Anything you did just made it worse. Anything you said, well, I have a black friend, well, that's racist to even think. Anything you said, I'm not racist. And Ibram Kendi said, there is no such thing as not racist. Robin D'Angelo said, to profess that you're not racist is to confess that you are racist. Anything you said made it worse. That's nullification. So the nullified church means anything an independent church does makes it worse for Christianity overall, which sets up the conditions of a struggle session because all the other churches are like, guys, cut it out. Your friends, your former friends, you'll find out, betray you. Just please get in line. You're making it harder for all of us. You being an independent church, you're the one kid crying out and causing trouble in class, and the whole class gets in trouble, so the whole class turns on the kid. That's the struggle session dynamic. And they will weaponize institutionalized churches, convention churches, against you. Guys, you're making it harder on all of us. We have to go through all these investigations because you have to have an independent voice. Just cut it out, and you're going to get struggled. You're going to become nullified. Every time you take a stand against COVID tyranny or any other tyranny, they're going to turn that into a bigger case against the domestic extremism hiding in the church. The nullifying narrative arc is already set. We heard it from Andrew Seidel in the House Unselect Committee for J6. But what will you hear in the wake of this is that churches, especially independent conservative churches, gospel churches, are in fact hotbeds of domestic extremism, white nationalism, and all the other things that the Department of Homeland Security and Department of Justice are mad about. And that's going to require investigation. That's going to require making sure you're not that. That's going to make you fill out paperwork. That's going to make you have all kinds of things that don't technically violate religious liberty, according to the Constitution, but just make it much harder to operate so you'll opt into the easier system. And then an opportune moment will come along. Somebody 
somewhere, eventually, will do something stupid. We can all imagine what would have happened at Dodgers Stadium had the reaction to that grotesque provocation gone ugly. Christians reacted. They're anti-LGBTQ. We all know they're anti-LGBTQ. Now they've gone up against these drag queens who are actually like satanic performers or whatever. They've done something awful. There's violence rising, anti-LGBTQ hate. We've got to clamp down on the churches within the bounds of the Constitution. Of course, true religion won't be affected, but we have to have something to say about domestic extremism that's rising up within them. They don't violate your liberty totally. They just encroach on it and make your life hard. That will be the biggest media spectacle for weeks if something of that kind happens, where they can now tie some extremist event of any kind in any of these narrative arcs to a Christian. They will declare Christian churches conservative ones in particular, breeding grounds of domestic terrorism and all the rest. They'll start inspecting and pressuring them. The pressure will increase and your friends will say, please just confess, please just make it go away, please just be the bigger man, apologize, and the struggle session will come to you. And then the captured conventions like the SBC and the PCA and all the rest will step in and broker a deal with, oh, they already did sort of, but they'll broker a deal with the government agencies. We'll handle all the paperwork. People on the convention don't have these problems. We have all these doctrinal agreements, statements that they've agreed to. In order to be an SBC or whatever other association, I'm not picking on them, all the conventions are gonna play if they're big. In order to be a member of our convention or association, here are the things they have to have signed up and agreed to. So if you join the convention, you get to bypass so much of the pressure. But the convention's captured. Now, in order to stay in the convention, you gotta bring in a woke pastor, or a Christian nationalist pastor, or whichever kind they need, whatever it is for the political moment of the day, which we saw earlier changes with the wind. And that's going to be the future of the American church in the first step. There will be the death of independent churches. You can always change your mind. You can be independent as long as you want, but it's just going to be hard, miserable, expensive, pain in the butt, constant problems. But if you just join one of the big conventions and sign on to all the statements, no problem. We'll fix it for you. And it'll be harder and harder and harder to stay out of them. Your stand against the uh, SBC will not be easy to keep. But what if Christian nationalism just falls flat? Can they still nullify the church? Oh, yeah. They have a backup plan, which is the other narrative arc of anti-LGBTQ hate in general. Christian nationalism is kind of perfect for this. They are framing themselves as the friend-enemy conflict about anti-LGBT stuff, the drag queens and the pride provocations and everything else. They've stepped right into that that huge escalating provocation. They're saying openly, your choices are two, Christian nationalism or queer Marxism grooming your kids. So they're giving you a false choice. But if Christian nationalism doesn't work, it doesn't matter. All they have to do is get Christians on camera or Christians over and over and over again spouting what they can frame clearly as anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, homophobic rhetoric, transphobic rhetoric, and if they can get the right precipitating events, they can get away with it anyway. This is an uncomfortable and challenging truth. There is a difference between gay civil rights and queer Marxism. If you can't tell the difference, you're not ready to deal with this. If we try to mix them together like the Christian nationalist movement overwhelmingly does to the point where apparently I've been labeled homosexual because I'm able to distinguish between them, that is literally the qualification that got me labeled a, quote, known homosexual. I've been married to a woman for 19 years. She is not aware of any of this, and nor am I, but maybe one day. It's not going to go well to try to relitigate the fight of the 1990s, this civil rights fight with the broader public. They will use it as the excuse to nullify churches if that fight is picked in a sloppy way. If you pretend that the thing that the queer Marxists, using queer theory and activism, are doing and say that that was always a slippery slope of the gay agenda back to the 90s, all they said, they lied to us, they just want to get married, now look, we have drag queens. If you buy into this whole narrative that they've laid out for you, that the Christian nationalist guys are are pushing, and you can't distinguish between civil rights, whether you agree with it or not, as an American point of freedom, and queer Marxist provocation on our society, this will not go well for the churches. 
They are luring you into that backup plan trap every day. And so the church, and this is not my place to do this, is going to need a non-reactionary response to queer theory. Very specifically queer theory, which is an identifiable and clear thing that has hidden itself behind gays and lesbians like human shields. It's what I actually said at the very beginning. I get accused of attacking Christians, just like if you call out one of these extreme Marxist things, queer Marxist activities, they say that you're attacking gay people. If you can't make that distinction and have a non-reactionary response to queer theory that makes that distinction, they will get you there. And this issue will be used to nullify Christians regardless of Christian nationalism, if you don't get savvy on it, if you don't get educated on it, and don't understand how they're tricking you and trapping you. That's the backup plan if the Christian nationalism thing doesn't take off. I don't know what that answer looks like. I know that there are very smart men and women of faith who can start to work on that and figure it out when they realize that there's a distinction to be made and uh, clarity to be brought to that discussion from a Christian perspective. So I challenge Christians to do that without stepping in to your space. So after nullification of the church, what's step two? Where do, what does the future of the American church look like? Well, we talked before that this is a Gnostic and Hermetic, that's the spiral, is Hermeticism, by the way, Gnostic and Hermetic heretical faith or cult religion. And they believe that all religions are the same religion. Remember, distinctions are illusions. So the distinction between Christianity and Buddhism is an illusion. They're both just two parts of the same truth. That's a heresy. But not just two religions. Every philosophy, every religion, every science. All just pieces of the same truth. Think of it like a gigantic diamond with lots of faces. Each face is like a religion, a science, or a philosophy. But the stone is what we're really about. The stone is what's called the Prisca Theologia. The ancient theology which is handed down by God directly to the most ancient of humans that we have slowly drifted from and forgotten. Every faith tradition, science, and philosophy on the planet is actually just pointing back to this one unified whole truth. So like super Unitarianism. That will be the religion of the future, except of course it will be synthetic, contrived, and fake. So what the future of the American church looks like is a contrived American church, a fake or synthetic American church posing as your church. Every church that signs on to the convention to get out from under the pressure of the federal government is going to get dragged toward a more and more and more doctrinally consistent thing where every religion in the world preaches the same thing in its own way. Might sound Christian, but it's preaching woke. Might sound Jewish, but it's preaching woke. Might sound Buddhist, but it's preaching woke. Might sound Protestant, Baptist, Calvinist, Methodist, Presbyterian, but it's preaching woke. Might sound New Age, but it's preaching woke. Might sound Muslim, but it's preaching woke. Might sound Anglican, Universalist, whatever, but it's preaching woke. Might sound like secular philosophy, but it's preaching woke. Might sound like physics, but it's preaching woke. Why? Because Klaus Schwab told us, we heard this earlier from Mike, values cannot be justified by intellect alone. That requires faith. They need to use faith to instill the new values of sustainability and inclusion for our sustainable and inclusive future, which will be the, the new world religion. So Christianity will be sustainable and inclusive Christianity, whether Catholic or Protestant. Islam will be sustainable and inclusion Islam, and on down the line. So you wear your pastor's, I guess, like polo shirt and shorts, and you wear your priest frock. That was a joke about pastors. It was about John, really. I think he wears pants, actually, but he's always cool and casual. I was shocked to see him in a suit earlier. Um, you're going to wear your regular clothes, the regular trappings. It's going to look like a church, but it's going to preach sustainability, inclusion, global citizenship, Agenda 2030, sustainable development goals. That's what. How do I know that? Well, first of all, I've read them a lot, and I kind of just know that that's what their goal is. But second of all, they wrote a paper in 2021 in the Journal of Religious Education. Now, this is about German religious education, not American. But it's titled, Global Citizenship Education as an Inclusive and Diversity Learning in Religious Education. 
So what's global citizenship? Global citizenship is believing in the sustainable development goals. They actually define it that way, so that you're a good citizen of the globe and this new world order that they're producing under the auspices of the sustainable development goals of United Nations Agenda 2030. Think I'm exaggerating. Let's read the abstract from this paper. School education is no longer just a place where students are supposed to deal with local phenomena and issues, but also with global ones. Every subject in German schools, such as religious education, has to make its own contribution to the global education of students. The goals of interest and educational policy associated with this vary as a result of the Agenda 21, which is, by the way, now updated to Agenda 2030, Goal 4.7, as a result of the Agenda 21 process, global education has been implemented in German curricula as, uh, as in many other countries. This article assumes that religious education achieves its goal precisely when it is designed to be inclusive and students experience the topics of human rights, dignity of the human person, and social justice in the classroom. For this to happen, diversity and difference must be valued and used as learning opportunities. I wasn't kidding. Religious education will all have to be geared, so religion later, at least a generation down, will all have to be geared toward the new world religion, the Prisca Theologia of sustainability and inclusion under Klaus Schwab, who when we tried to play a video of him earlier, obviously God said no and screamed with feedback until we made it go away. I always joke, you know, we went to the church, I didn't catch on fire, ha ha ha. We put Klaus on the screen and everything went to hell. It was really kind of a... Uh, Kind of biblical. So the result of Christian nationalism and this dialectical action-reaction program is the end of religious liberty. There will still be church. The church will just be contrived, contrived to support the agenda, to hijack your religion, to promote the values of sustainability and inclusion or whatever else they change it to the next year, because they will have at that point complete arbitrary power. They will continually make it harder and harder not to go along with the program. Resistance is futile with the Borg. You can go to any church you want as long as it's on the program. Other churches will find it harder and harder to exist. Very easy to just sign up, sign it away. It's just your soul. You didn't need it. It's like Obamacare for churches. You can keep your pastor if you like. So in summary of these two talks, Mao did dialectical political warfare and he moved his, his, his agenda through a friend-enemy distinction, which created an action-reaction and an internal and an external dialectic. We have American Maoism happening through identity politics, driving that same agenda here in the United States and throughout the West, also through the same dialectical process, friend-enemy and action-reaction distinctions. This is our cultural revolution here in the West, and we have to stop it. Our enemies could win, though, with their left hand, which is that we just let them get it, or with their right by getting a reaction that they use as their real action, or the two working together back and forth. We have to stop the cultural revolution, but that means we have to understand the action-reaction dynamic. We have to understand mid-level violence and the provocations, the decision dilemmas, the escalating, uh, the escalating provocations that they use to get us to react in a way that is politically useful for their political warfare, we have to understand the operating system that drives it in this direction, which is that dialectical thought, which means we have to understand the proper principles, not just how it works, but principles for engaging in dialectical political warfare. Now, I want to give you the first really good news of any of my talks so far, maybe ever. This is actually comprehensible, and once we understand how the war is being fought, we can win. I'm utterly convinced that we can learn this very quickly, we can get good at this very quickly, and we can defeat them very quickly, but we have to learn how they think, how they operate, how they fool us, and how they get us to do their bidding through dialectical political warfare. So my talk in the morning will be how to stop a cultural revolution, and it will be principles for engagement in dialectical political warfare. Thank you for bearing with me this evening. I'm very pleased to talk about this. <laughs>